The Unusual Wikipedia Articles, Iceberg Explained Wikipedia Articles We've all looked at them. We've all at least once tried to write our own submissions for topics. Wikipedia itself is just well known. In this Iceberg Explained video, we'll be looking at unusual articles in Wikipedia, and I will say that some of the entries towards the end get pretty graphic, and some of the words and like terminology will have to be altered so that I don't get destroyed by YouTube. I will be using code words for certain words that can't be used, so I will display them on the screen so you know what I'm talking about. I would like to thank I'm a Vegan Shish Kebab for creating the chart and for helping me with the entries. I don't want to waste any more of your guys' time, so let's get straight into it. This is the unusual Wikipedia articles, Iceberg Explained. The Nazca Lines are a group of very large geoglyphs that can be found in the Nazca Desert in Peru. They were created by people making depressions or shallow incisions in the desert floor, removing pebbles and leaving differently colored dirt exposed. After trying to understand the culture behind it, it was claimed that the Nazca people may have used and created these lines to be seen by the deities in the sky, while others have claimed that they could have been used as part of a ritual to summon water, but I don't really see how that would work. There have been many sightings regarding these lines. For example, there's the spider, the giant, the hand, and my favorite, the monkey. The Shags were an American all-female rock and outsider music band formed in 1968. The band was composed of sisters Dorothy, Betty, Helen, and Rachel Wiggins. The band was formed after their father, Austin Wiggins, who believed that his mother had predicted their rise to stardom as she believed that he would have daughters that would form a popular music group in which he acted quickly and set them up to be artists. They released their one and only studio album titled Philosophy of the World in 1969, but it failed to gain the attention they expected in which they then continued to perform locally. However, their music career was cut short in 1975 after the death of their father. Surprisingly, years later after the release of their album, it garnered more attention as some snippets of their music were talked about by other bands and talk shows. The Centennial Light is the world's longest lasting light bulb burning since 1901. Well, except that one time in 2013 when it shot off for nearly 10 hours, but it was later confirmed by an electrician that it didn't technically burn out. The power supply was just faulty. It's currently located in Livermore, California and is maintained by the Livermore Fire Department. So how has it lasted so long? Well, it's acknowledged that the light seems to have decreased in power over time, which allows it to keep going on longer. When is it expected to finally burn out? No one actually knows. If you're somehow interested in watching this light bulb's journey, you can go on its website and watch a live stream of it. I guess that's a good way to kill a couple of hours. The Unst Bus Shelter, also known as Bobby's Bus Shelter, I'm just gonna call it that is a bus shelter and bus stop near the village of Baltasound in Shetland, Scotland. Now, why the name Bobby's Bus Shelter? Who's Bobby? The name actually honors Bobby McCauley, a child who used to ride his bike to the shelter to catch the bus to school. At one point, the bus shelter was removed back in 1996 after the local council decided to take it away. Little Bobby obviously hated that decision and wrote a letter to the council explaining the importance of it. After reading the letter, the council was touched by it and built a brand new one. Looking at the shelter now, it's periodically decorated. For example, it was decorated as a World Cup theme after Bobby's visit to the 2010 FIFA World Cup. When that theme is done with, people would bring sofas, TVs, and other decorations to the shelter. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if people actually slept there during the nights. Real life superhero, as described by Wikipedia's definition, is a person who dresses up in a superhero costume in order to perform community service such as Neighborhood Watch. Some of these heroes could also be used for publicity and marketing campaigns. For example, Super Vaslav was a promotional figure for a Czech web hosting company back in 2011. His sole purpose was to go against people misbehaving in the city. In one of these videos, he throws a bucket of water at someone who's smoking a cigarette at a bus stop. Now, some may argue and say that there's alternative ways of dealing with these types of situations. However, in most scenarios, the police should be the only ones involved in dealing with these types of people, as these so-called superheroes are technically getting in the way of police work and there's a fear of safety for the heroes. Penn and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors is an unreleased video game that stars both magician Penn and Teller. The game was meant to be released on the Sega CD in April 1995. 
The game consisted of several mini-games and adventure platform games. The purpose of the game was to enable the player to fool their friends by different means, since basically all the mini-games were scams and tricks. Now, why was the game never released? Absolute Entertainment was the company that was supposed to publish the game, but they went out of business before the game could be released. And since there were no other companies interested in the game, it was never released. Okay, now that that's out the way, let's look at the gameplay. There were a total of 6 mini games, and out of all of them, I found the Desert Bus to be probably the most interesting. Gameplay wise, it was pretty simple. The objective of the game was to drive a bus from Tucson, Arizona to Las Vegas, Nevada. Here's the thing though. The game ran in real time, meaning the maximum speed was 40 miles per hour, and it would take 8 hours of continuous play to complete the trip once. Now this isn't your typical game. It's like driving an actual vehicle and your full attention must be paid. If you swerve off too much, the bus can actually stall and it will have to be towed back to the start. By the way, the towing of the car is also played in real time. There's footage of people actually completing the full 8 hours and even though they may seem happy accomplishing this, deep down we all know there's a whole ton of regret as well. The Atari Video Game Burial was a gigantic burial of unsold video game cartridges, consoles, and computers in a New Mexico landfill site that was managed by Atari. In September 1983, it was reported that between 10 to 20 truckloads worth of Atari items were crushed and buried at the landfill within the city of El Paso, Texas. An Atari official claimed that Atari was mostly sending broken and returned material to the landfill site. There's a ton of speculation towards this as people have come forward who worked for Atari exposing the truth and people working on the site have suggested other reasonings behind this. Till this day, it's still widely speculated that a majority of the dump games had to be the E.T. extraterrestrial games since it's viewed as being one of the worst video games of all time and Atari had to get rid of the unused copies of the game and attempt to erase the memory of the game. Archie vs Predator is a comic book and intercompany crossover written by Alex DeCampi. The book is about a trophy hunting alien that arrives on Earth and begins stalking Archie Andrews and his classmates. After a number of students get murdered, the remaining realize that they need to fight back in order to survive. To me, it sounded like such a simple concept for a comic book, but it did receive a ton of positive feedback for the crossover and dark humor. The Most Unwanted Song is an experimental type of song created by artists Komar and Melamid and composer Dave Soldier in 1997. The purpose of the song was to include lyrical and musical elements that were annoying to most people. They figure out what people dislike the most by creating poll surveys and releasing them to the public. Some of these aspects included cowboy music, bagpipes, tubas, and so on. After listening to the song, the most annoying element that stood out is when they're singing children urging the listeners to go shopping at Walmart. Yeah, so I wouldn't recommend listening to the song as it's literally 22 minutes of trash. POP50 is a three-wheeled minicar originally made from 1962 to 1965 by the Peel Engineering Company and is listed as one of the smallest production car ever made. When advertised in the 1960s, it was capable of seating one adult and a shopping bag. The car also included only one windshield wiper and one headlight. Getting a hold of one of these cars is extremely rare, as only 50 were ever produced and 27 are only known to exist. Imagine just driving around and then you see this pass you. Okay, now that layer 1 is done, let's look at layer 2. Cow tipping sounds exactly what it is. Cow tipping is an activity that involves a person sneaking up on an unsuspecting sleeping cow and pushing it over for fun. The idea of cow tipping comes from the presumption that cows are slow and weak legged, making them easy targets. But personally, I don't think anyone would want to get involved with cow tipping. Unless you're weird. Bubbles is a chimpanzee that was once kept as a pet by the one and only Michael Jackson. Bubbles was bought from a Texas research facility in the 1980s and frequently traveled with Jackson throughout his career. Bubbles lived with him until he became unsuitable as a pet in which he was then moved into an ape sanctuary where he has lived since 2005. They both definitely had a great connection despite many people believing that it was odd. They spent so much time together that Bubbles even eventually learned how to moonwalk. However, all good things must come to an end as when Michael Jackson died in 2009, it was reported that Bubbles showed signs of extreme sadness. 
They both had such a great connection, and he even considered Bubbles as his first child. Till this day, Bubbles is still at the same sanctuary and is taken well care of, as the Jacksons have continued to support the annual care costs for Bubbles at the sanctuary. Ferdinand Chevel was a French postman who spent around 30 years of his life building the ideal palace. He began the building in April 1879 when he was 43 years old. He got inspired to make this as one day when he was walking home, his foot got stuck on a stone, which caused him to trip. The stone had a unique shape to it, and he carried it along the way as he admired it. The next day, he went to the same spot and found more stones that he would collect. For the next 30 years, he picked up stones daily and brought them back to his house to build his palace. 20 of those years were only spent working on the outer walls, which consists of stones, pebbles, and fossils. When he finally completed it, it was hard to believe that only one man built the palace. The palace only received recognition a couple years before his death as many poets, artists, and painters admired his work. Before he died, he was planning on being buried in his palace, but this is considered illegal in France. So he continued to spend another 8 more years building a mausoleum for himself, in which was where he was buried. False memory is an occurrence where someone recalls something that didn't happen or recalls it differently from the way it actually happened. All this entry really deals with are the effect of false memories, some natural factors for the formation of false memories, some series and other types of false memories such as the Mandela effect. Wojtek was a Syrian brown soldier bear. Let's just say he wasn't necessarily your typical soldier. After being bought at a railway station from two Polish soldiers, they were both about to fight alongside the British 8th Army in the Italian campaign. However, the transport didn't allow pet animals onto the ship, so they decided to officially draft Wojtek into the Polish army as a private. Since he was officially considered a soldier, he actually did a lot of transportation work. He seemed to get along with the other members as he supposedly enjoyed drinking, eating cigarettes, and even wrestling with them while they were on their break. Just imagine the other soldiers seeing a bear literally just casually working with the soldiers. After the war, he was sent to the Edinburgh Zoo in which he officially retired and gained a lot of popularity and media attention from the press. Everyone loved him and some soldiers even went back to the zoo to greet him and give him more cigarettes. However, he sadly passed away years later at the age of 21. I'm sure they'll always remember him as an honorary member. A Book from the Sky is a book created by Chinese artist Zhu Bing. Now the thing about this book is that it's entirely filled with meaningless glyphs that resemble traditional Chinese characters. The book is made up using a set of 4,000 characters, which is roughly the number of characters in common usage in modern written Chinese. The characters were designed on the idea of the Kangxi radicals, which gives the characters the appearance of being real. It's often thought that the work is his reflection of the manipulation and misuse of language and text during Mao Zedong's reign. David Hahn, also known as the Nuclear Boy Scout, was a man who built a homemade neutron source at the age of 17. He later received a merit badge in atomic energy and came up with the idea of creating a breeder reactor in his house. So he began to collect radioactive material from household products, However, as soon as the reactor reached high levels of radiation, the police were informed about it and later dismantled the shed, which had the reactor, and they had to clean up everything. Many years later in 2007, he was suspected of having another reactor in his house. Around this time, Han's mental state wasn't entirely there. He supposedly had schizophrenia and was overdosing on cocaine. Even though there wasn't any intentions regarding that he was going to cause problems with the reactor, the authorities just felt that it was safe to check up and investigate his actions. A couple months later, he was arrested and charged with larceny for taking people's smoke detectors. His bad drug habits caught up to him even worse, which led to his death in 2016 after being intoxicated with alcohol and fentanyl. Tempo OS is a PC operating system for recreational programming, or in other words, a biblical themed operating system created by American programmer Terry Davis. Now, how did Terry Davis do this? Well, supposedly, God guided him. You see, Mr. Davis experienced a ton of maniac episodes in his late 20s and would often be out of touch. Until one day after experiencing a self-described revelation, he was convinced that he was in direct communication with God and that God told him that the operating system was for God's third temple. Now, I'm no computer programmer so I don't know that much about how his system worked, 
But by judging by some of the articles and posts about the system, people were shocked to hear that one man created this. The crazy thing was that for many people, it was actually hard to take him seriously. Mr. Davis would frequently livestream himself working on the system, and while streaming, he would have some controversial takes. Even after his death in 2018, the legacy of Temple OS is still appreciated by many. Extraterrestrial real estate refers to the land ownership on other planets, natural satellites, or parts of space by organizations or individuals. Believe it or not, many private organizations and individuals have claimed ownership of celestial bodies, such as the moon, and are involved in selling parts of them through ownership certificates. The rest of the article just discusses orbital real estate, the laws surrounding this topic, and it later goes on to look at the Outer Space Treaty, which announces fair use of space activity and the claims of sovereignty when it comes to the moon and celestial bodies. After reading all about this, buying a portion of the moon actually doesn't seem that bad. Exceed 4000 was a concept for a skyscraper. The idea was initially created and developed by Martin Pasco. The metrics for the building were meant to be 4 kilometers in height while being 6 kilometers wide. Adding on, it was meant to have a 800 floor capacity that would accommodate 500,000 to 1 million people. It was expected to be a futuristic environment combining ultra modern and technological living and interaction with wildlife and nature. Even though the building hasn't been built and will likely never be built, it's still crazy to imagine that a building that massive was actually proposed to be built at one point. Robert Shields puts all diarists to shame. Let's just say he's best known for writing a diary that was estimated to be around 37 and a half million words. He documented every 5 minutes of his life from 1972 until 1997, in which then he literally couldn't write anymore due to a stroke which left him disabled. He spent around 4-5 to five hours in his office every day literally documenting about everything about his life, which includes him recording his body temperature, blood pressure, even describing his urination, like no one needs to know about that. Also, it was reported that he would sleep in 2 hour intervals so that he could describe his dreams in his diary. It's kinda shocking to hear that he was that committed to document his life for that long, and for having a consistent schedule in writing. In 1999, he donated all of his work to the Washington State University. However, under the terms of his donation of the diary to the university, the book cannot be read or subjected to an exact word for 50 years from his death. Roy Sullivan was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. After reading what this guy was known for, I actually kind of felt bad for him. Like, this guy probably has the worst luck ever. So, Roy Sullivan is known for being hit seven times by lightning, and he somehow managed to survive them all. So, congrats to him. But keep in mind that the chances of being struck by lightning is 1 in 500,000, and he got struck seven times. The first time he got struck was when he was in a lookout tower trying to avoid a thunderstorm. The second time he was hit while driving his truck. The third time, he was just chilling in his front yard. The fourth time, he was working inside his ranger station. The fifth time, he tried to outrun the storm while patrolling the park. The sixth time, he once again tried to outrun the storm while in the park. And the last and final time involved him getting struck while fishing. To make things even worse, when he got inside his car, there was a bear that approached him and tried to steal his trout from the fishing line. He luckily managed to fight off the bear with a tree branch. Honestly, reading all of this just seems faked and made up, but I feel that anything could happen with this guy's luck. Apparently, later on in his life, he was avoided by many people because they feared that they would also get struck by lightning. But at that point, would you even blame them? Project Steve is a list of scientists with the name Steve, or a variation of that name, who support evolution. The project was named in honor of the paleontologist Stephen J. Gold. The project began in 2003, and as of today, there have been around 1,400 signatures. The project was quick to catch attention earlier on, but has started to decrease recently since there's a lack of people signing it. And that wraps it up for Layer 2, let's look at Layer 3. 
The Glasgow Ice Cream Wars were turf wars in Glasgow, Scotland in the 1980s between rival criminal organizations selling drugs and stolen goods from ice cream vans. These actually got pretty intense and one of the worst cases was in April 1984 in where the Doyle family, a family of six, were all victims of an arson attack which quickly led to their deaths in their own home. After this received media attention, the public was outraged about the deaths. Two men who were tried and convicted are named Thomas Campbell and Joe Steele, who were both sentenced to life. To sum it up, there were a ton of appeals and one witness even ended up lying, which led the case to be reassessed back in 2001. After fighting through it, they were both released in 2004 and the actual arsonists were never discovered. However, all this turf war violence started to gradually decrease as the rise of corner shops occurred, meaning that there was a decrease in demand for mobile commercial ice cream vans. The Celeste Ossuary is a small Roman Catholic chapel in Czech Republic. This isn't your typical chapel as the interior contains skeletons between 40,000 to 70,000 people in which their bones have been arranged to form decorations and furnishings for the building. During the 1400s and the Black Death, thousands of people were buried in the cemetery, but eventually that became too much so they had to start moving some people in the chapel. Later on, they hired architects and woodcarvers to make designs using the bones. It's just kind of odd that these bones are used, but it's just crazy to think that they had so much bones to accomplish this artwork. Mutiny on the Bounty was a mutiny on the HMS Bounty that occurred in the South Pacific Ocean back in April 1789, led by acting lieutenant Fletcher Christian, who actually took control of the ship from their captain, William Blig, and set him and 10 other loyalists in the ship open launch. The original mission was meant to acquire breadfruit plants and transport them to the West Indies, but was never actually accomplished. The Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex that was written using an unknown writing system. The origins, authorship, and purpose of the manuscript are heavily debated. Some believe that it's a form of natural language or constructed language, a cipher, and some even believe that it could just be a hoax. The manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, a Polish book dealer who purchased it in 1912. Even though it has been studied by many professional cryptographers and codebreakers, the manuscript has never been deciphered. The only speculation that may have some truth about the meaning of the manuscript is that it was meant to address topics of early modern medicines and herbal remedies. The Solway First Spaceman is an extremely well-known picture that you guys have probably seen. Jim Templeton, the man who took the picture, insisted that he did not see anyone when the photograph was taken. Once this picture was released in the media, many believed that it looked like a spaceman, which then became more believable after the camera company Kodak confirmed that the picture was genuine. However, this was later debunked as it was analyzed that it had most likely been Templeton's wife who was there at the time. Since the camera he was using likely had a viewfinder that only let you see a certain amount of space, his wife could have appeared in the background without him knowing. Also, there were other pictures taken that day which showed his wife in the background. Even though she was wearing a blue dress, the overexposure would have made that dress pure white. People have also used editing softwares to darken the image and straighten it out, but then the picture just appears to be normal. So in the end, no spaceman. Deno Senshi Porygon, I'm so sorry for butchering that, is a banned Pokemon episode and phenomenon known as the Pokemon Shock, which was episode 38 in the first season of Pokemon. The episode contained repetitive visual effects that triggered epileptic seizures, which affected around 685 children. However, there were other reports suggesting that as many as 12,000 kids were affected and had to be hospitalized. The scene took place 20 minutes into the episode when Pikachu stopped missiles with his thunderbolt attack, which resulted in an explosion that flashed red and blue lights. There were other scenes that had the same like red and blue strobe lights, but this particular scene was more intense than usual as they used a technique known as the Paka Paka, where two colors flashed rapidly on the screen. The next day, the broadcast station released an apology and would further investigate, in which the episode was then pulled from being aired. Vodka eyeballing is the practice of consuming vodka by pouring it into the eye socket. And that's all I'm going to say for this entry. Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Laboratory was a toy lab set created by Alfred Gilbert. Weirdly enough, the purpose of the kit was to allow children to create and watch nuclear and chemical reactions using radioactive material. I don't necessarily know why he thought it was smart to make this a kid's toy, but let's move on. Now obviously there was a ton of criticism towards this toy, 
due to the dangers of it. However, the creator of the kit pushed the idea that the use of chemical reactions directed towards children creates a potential career in science and engineering. I'm sorry, but no little kid wants to play with a toy because of educational purposes. They want to play with a toy because it looks cool, which it did actually look interesting, but it was obviously not safe. Thankfully, the kit was never popular, and it was estimated that fewer than 5,000 kits were sold, and was only available through 1950 to 1951. He then came to the realization that the kit was unsuccessful, as it was probably more appropriate for those who had an actual background, rather than a bunch of kids. I don't know how we didn't see that from the start, but uh, let's move on. Daniel Lambert, Tarare, and Charles Domery are three men who had weird eating disorders. Tarare and Charles were both men who just ate whatever. It varied from grass, cats, snakes, even some aspects of cannibalism. Literally, whatever you could think of, they probably ate that. It was suggested that they both suffered from hyperthyroidism, which is why they just ate everything. Now, Daniel Lambert was a bit different. Kinda. He also did suffer from an eating disorder, but he was actually a well-respected man. At the time, there was no one really as big as him, so people even paid money just to visit him, as he was supposedly a very intelligent man and a unique person. At least he had something going for his life, unlike the other guys who just ate cats for a living. The Max Headroom broadcast signal was a television broadcasting hijacked that occurred in November 1987 in the form of a piracy video of an unknown person wearing a Max Headroom mask and costume. Two interruptions were involved. The first one lasted around 28 seconds in where the Max Headroom intruder could be seen mimicking the real Max Headroom and there was strange background noises. The second one occurred a couple hours later and was a bit longer. It involved the same person but this time they called the WGN sportcaster Chuck Swirsky a freaking liberal. He also sang a couple song lyrics and did a bunch of weird things. Then there's the second part of it where another person comes to the shot and does this. Yeah, it just gets weird. Since then, no one has come forward regarding the hijacking and it still remains a mystery. People have suggested that this was likely an inside job by one of the WGN employees who had like a personal vendetta or like a grudge against Chuck Swirsky. Phineas Gage was an American railroad construction foreman who was remembered for surviving an incident in which a large iron rod was completely driven through his head, destroying most of his frontal lobe. This happened back when he was working as a foreman for a crew, in which he was using the rod to pack explosive powder into a hole. Out of nowhere, the powder detonated, which sent the rod straight into his head. He was somehow still alive after that, and was able to speak to the people around him, in which he was sent to the hospital immediately. Life after the incident was pretty rough for him because he did suffer from a lot of mental issues, and later on in his life, his sister and his mom had to take care of him. Despite such a tragic death, there was a ton of influence regarding the incident as it helped the understanding on early neurology. Marvin Hemeyer was an automobile repair shop owner who demolished numerous buildings with his modified bulldozer known as the Killdozer. The reason on why he went on a rampage was because he was outraged at the local officials who disconnected his business from the city's sewage system to make way for a concrete plant. So over an 18 month period, he developed the Killdozer. I'm so surprised how we managed to hide it for so long, and apparently there were a couple of men who visited the shed in which that was where the bulldozer was hiding, but they never questioned it. The demolition day began on June 4th, 2004, in which he just went, this guy literally just went insane. His rampage lasted for around 2 hours, and after it was over, he ended up shooting himself to probably avoid the consequences. Overall, the damage was estimated to be around $7 million. He also left 3 audio tapes regarding the motivation for his attack, in which he basically said that it was God's plan for this to happen, and that God set him to do this. Which was people saying that God is the reason behind everything they do. Like, I don't think God would ever say like, yeah, so I want you to grab a bulldozer, you know, customize it, make it a killdozer, and just go absolutely insane with it. But anyway, shortly after the event, the killdozer was scrapped and was never seen again. Layer 3 is finished, let's look at Layer 4. Sonic Dreams Collection is a 2015 art game developed by Arcane Kids that's an unofficial game based on the Sonic the Hedgehog series. The game consists of 4 mini games. however the game takes a dark turn as it's later revealed to be a psychological horror game covering the modern Sonic fandom. The four games are titled Make My Sonic, which is just a glitchy character creator, Eggman Origin, which is just a multiplayer role-playing game, 
Sonic Movie Maker, an adventure game that involves the player going around filming multiple scenes, and My Roommate Sonic, which is a VR game that involves sending text messages to Sonic in order to get some love from him. I wouldn't necessarily call these horror games, they're more just obscure and weird. The two games being the weirdest are probably Sonic Movie Maker and My Roommate Sonic, which when completed shows this weird scene. Elsagate refers to the controversy surrounding videos that appeared on YouTube that are categorized as child friendly, but these videos actually contain inappropriate scenes for children. The term Elsagate comes from the word Elsa, the main character from Frozen, who's frequently depicted in the videos, and Gate, a common suffix for scandals. These channels started to get attention in 2017. The term started to get mainstream media attention for popular news outlets and tons of videos were made on the phenomenon as more of these scandals started to become more noticed. These videos would range from weird to just inappropriate topics. Here's some of the thumbnails and titles of videos that were posted. There were a ton of complaints from basically everyone saying that these videos are damaging and affecting the children horribly, in which YouTube finally responded in August 2017, where they announced their new guidelines on content and monetization. They announced that creators wouldn't be allowed to monetize new videos that made inappropriate use of family-friendly characters, and a new policy that age restricts this type of content in the YouTube main app when flagged. YouTube then went on a deleting and termination spree as over 270 accounts were terminated and they removed over 150,000 videos. And they also disabled ads from numerous channels that displayed this type of content. Honestly, great job on YouTube's part, but there's probably still unknown channels that make these types of videos. The Broomway is known as the Perilous Pass in Britain as it's thought to have killed more than 100 people over the centuries. The Broomway is a footpath over the foreshore at Mapland Sands off of the coast of Essex, England. The track is extremely dangerous in misty weather as the incoming tide floods across the sands at high speed and the water can form whirlpools. Even when the surface is walkable at a low tide, it's not completely safe as there's still patches of mud and quicksand. Since there's sand in all directions, it's quite difficult to stay on track. Piss Christ is a 1987 photograph taken by artist and photographer Andres Serrano. The picture shows a small plastic crucifix that was put into a small glass tank of the artist's urine. Now obviously this was deemed as controversial for obvious reasons. However, the creator describes it as You know, I feel like you have to look at what the crucifix actually represents. You know, it represents uh, the, 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 the death of a man who was uh, cruelly put to death who not only, you know, not only peed on himself, probably shit on himself on that cross for three days, you know? All, everything came out. It was a disgusting, torturous way to die, you know? He then later goes on to explain how he was born and raised as a Christian, and this wasn't intended to poke fun at the religion. People still didn't like that response, and the picture received a lot of attention, even appearing in art galleries. At one point, it was even vandalized by Christian protesters, while in an exhibition in an art museum in France. Alien Hand Syndrome is a group of conditions in which a person experiences their limbs act on their own without conscious control over the actions. It's best shown in cases where a person has had the two hemispheres of the brain surgically separated or after anything revolving around the brain or frontal lobe. At the moment, there's no direct cure for the syndrome. However, the symptoms can be reduced and managed to some degree by keeping the hand occupied and involved in tasks. Polkasari is a 1985 North Korean dark fantasy action film directed by Sing Sang Hok and Chong Gon Jo. The movie revolves around the legend of the Bulgasari and is based on a lost 1962 film from South Korea of the same name. The plot of the film is centered in feudal Korea. The evil king becomes aware that the peasants are planning to perform a rebellion in the country. He then decides to take all of their tools and basically anything they could have used to defend themselves. He then returns the property to the people. However, an old blacksmith is in prison for defending the people and later starved to death. His last creation before dying was a tiny figurine of a monster, which we know as Palgasari. Later on, Palgasari fights with the poor and peasants to overcome the corrupt monarchy. Rule 34 is an internet proverb which asserts the idea that internet P exists in every possible topic. Rule 34 states, there is P of it no exceptions. By now, I would think that it's safe to assume that most people have heard about this, so there's no need to carry on. The Zone of Death is the Idaho section of the Yellowstone National Park, which is considered to be a loophole in the constitution of the US 
since it's believed that a criminal could avoid prosecution for any major crime in the area. The U.S. District Court for the District of Wyoming is the only U.S. court to have jurisdiction over parts of multiple states. This includes Yellowstone National Park, which extends beyond Wyoming's boundaries into Idaho and Montana. The federal government also has exclusive jurisdiction over the park, so it's believed that crimes committed in the park cannot be prosecuted. However, this has been proven to be untrue, and you can't get away with murder illegally. John Teeter is a pseudonym used on numerous bulletin boards during the early 2000s by a poster claiming to be an American military time traveler from the year 2036. Several predictions were made about how time travel works and how it would affect the past, future, and the world line of the planet. One of his more popular series was the Many Worlds Interpretations, which meant there were an infinite number of universes with an infinite number of possibilities. Some of his famous predictions were there would be a civil war in the US which would be linked to the result of the presidential election in 2004, the CERN would discover the basis for time travel in 2001, and a pandemic linked to mad cow disease would be prevalent in the US in 2036. There was many questions and concerns regarding if this was real or not, and it was believed to be a hoax. The Aristocrats is a dark humor joke that has been told by a number of stand-up comedians since the vaudeville era in which the setup and punchline are almost always the same. It's the joke's midsection that makes or breaks a particular redemption. Saddam Hussein's novels are about his four written novels. The four books are titled Zabiha and the King, The Fortified Castle, Men and the City, and Be Gone Demons. People view these novels strangely, especially Zibaha and the King, since it's more of a love story and it's just an unexpected topic he would discuss. Roar is a 1981 American adventure comedy film written from the works of Noel Marshall. The story follows Hank, who is a naturalist who lives on a nature preserve with tigers, lions, and other big cats. When his family visits him, they're confronted by the big group of cats instead of seeing Hank, and there's a whole entire mix-up. The whole idea behind the movie was actually brought during the filming of another movie in which the director and his wife came across an abandoned plantation house which had been overrun by a pride of lions. They were told by the locals that animal populations were becoming endangered due to poaching, which is what brought them to the idea of the movie. Despite the unique idea, the film didn't receive that much attention and was despised due to its lack of storytelling, acting, and overall production. Most people just liked the on-screen action of the lions and the tigers, so at least that was good. The Day the Clown Cried is an unfinished 1972 Swedish-French drama film directed by and starring Jerry Lewis. The plot of the movie is about a German circus clown named Helmut Dork, and is taking place during the Holocaust. Once a famous performer, Helmut has passed his prime and receives little respect. After causing an accident in a circus show and ranting about how trash Germany was, he gets arrested and is sent to a Nazi camp. He gets a little recognition from the other prisoners in the camp at first, but he eventually builds the courage to perform and he gets the respect from some of the people. However, the guards don't appreciate his work and he's later sent to solitary confinement, in which he is then forced to lead the Jewish children to the gas chambers and we all know what happens next. The film was never released due to it being controversial and Harry Lewis even admitted that he was embarrassed about the film as a whole. However, he did give a copy of the movie to the Library of Congress back in 2015 in which they both agreed that the film wouldn't be screened before June 2024. So we're almost there. Cicada 3301 is a nickname given to an organization that posted three sets of puzzles in order to recruit code breakers from the public. If you know about internet mysteries, you most definitely have heard about this before. Also, it's probably one of the most popular mysteries on the internet ever. It first made its appearance on the internet in 2012 on 4chan. People have solved the first two parts of the mystery. However, the third part, which was released in 2016, hasn't been solved yet. And that wraps up Slayers 1 to 4. Part 2 of the video will be uploaded tomorrow. I already have it recorded and downloaded, so that will be definitely be uploaded tomorrow. If you like this video, please consider subscribing as I will be making more of these videos in the near future. But yeah, I hope you guys are excited for part 2 which will be uploaded tomorrow and I'll see you guys then.